Thank you, Zimbabwe, for tuning in to yet another informative edition of your program. This is Agricultural New Directions Agribusiness, and my name is Wadzanae Manyore. So this is a platform which was specifically created for our farming community here in Zimbabwe. This is where we discuss everything agriculture. We look at production, economics, business, finance, time value of money, to mention but a few. Now, in this very episode today, we have come all the way from Harare to Norton. We are here at Kentaya Smart Farming, where they are specializing in dairy farming. To discuss this and more African the liberty of first of all talking to Mai Makoni. Mai Makoni, welcome to our platform. Thank you so much for Zanai and thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, this is Kentaya Smart Dairy Private Limited. We started in 2019, that's when we bought the plot and we had no, we had no animals mm -hmm. and then in April of 2020 we bought our seven in cow heifers from Beatrice so that was our starter stock. And then in the same year, there was a project mm -hmm. uh, sponsored by the, the European Union in partnership with the government of Zimbabwe. They are just looking at the whole dairy value chain. So they were giving like, you know, startups like ourselves um, assets to help with the, their startups. So here at Kantai Smart Dairy in particular, we got the we got uh, four in calf uh, heifers, mm -hmm. and this was a matching grant. So because they'd given me four, I also had to get my four to match the four that they'd given me. So from uh, my initial stock of seven, I got four through the program, which made it eleven, and then I had to buy another four to make now my match, which then gave us a total of fifteen in calf heifers. So this was mid 2020. So we started our milking in mid 2021, and we were doing about 18 liters of milk per cow per mm -hmm. day, because our the cows were mostly Jersey. And then since then the story continues. Like you know, we keep on getting heifers, and we keep on buying in cows or in, in cow heifers just to build our stock, because our target is to have a minimum of 15 milking cows because that is what we consider the, the economic business unit. Otherwise, okay. it doesn't make much sense. Thank you so much, May Marco. And I can tell from your description that you are a hands-on farmer. You really know where you began and where you are going. You do have a vision. Now, speaking of a look into the future, before we get there, I want us to talk about the capital intensity of this project. In terms of economic muscle, what are we talking about? Is it a long-term investment? Is it a short-term investment? Can you take us through that? I wouldn't call it a short-term investment, definitely. I would classify it as a long-term investment because like just the starter stock, like I told you, I started with uh, seven in cow heifers mm -hmm. and each one of those, the price of such heifers ranges from about 1,500 to about $2,000. Mm -hmm. So you can see with my, star, my five, you can do the numbers. It's upwards of uh, $5,000 just for the starter stock. And then there are feeds. Like, you know, for us and with our experience, you just can't start with the animals. Actually, you, had, you have to work out your feed budgets so that by the time the animals come to the farm, you have the feed. And uh, basically, when I talk feed, you need to feed your dairy animals silage, mm -hmm. which maybe you can grow the crop for yourself, harvest and make the silage, or maybe you can buy in the crop and then make silage, but for the better part, people are growing the crop. So it's just as good as growing a maize crop, whereby you need the fertilizer, the seed, the herbicide, and the pesticide. All those inputs you need money for. And then when I go to the concentrates that we use as a um, dairy meal that you also mix with the silage, they also don't come cheap. And I'm sure if you were to look like about 50 kgs of a bag, it costs from about maybe the very least is about $19, mm -hmm. going all the way up to about $23, $24, $25. So you really need money up front. And then depending on how you are doing your milking, most people hand milk, like if they have a few animals, but you can only do hand milking with you know, up to a certain number of animals. Once you have so many animals, hand milking may really put you in a bad place in mm -hmm. terms of the, pro the, 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 the yield of your milk, because if you are hand milking, you will not strip the udder. There will be some milk left in the udder, mm -hmm. and that is money going to waste, to waste. Mm -hmm. 
or worse still now if you if you are not emptying the others there's potential that your cows can then get uh, a disease a daily daily other disease mm -hmm. which is called mastitis and mastitis you know is not easy to get rid of once you have mastitis in your head it's like i said it's not an easy disease to get rid of in some instances if it's acute you may actually have to get rid of the animals oh, okay. yeah so yeah i've talked in terms of assets in terms of feeds and then just the machinery that you need i'm sure behind me you can see there is a feed mixer yes like you know once you are also dealing with this you know a, a high a, a big number of animals you can't hand mix oh you can hand mix but it takes time yes so it's either you do that or you know you have you know men labor now my macon as we close this segment i would like you to talk to us in terms of you are a woman we are talking of women empowerment you are into dairy farming you are very eloquent in what you were telling us can you just give us a brief rundown of the activities per day i can see you are hands-on thank you so much for the night our day here at Kintai Smart Day starts at 3 in the morning mm -hmm. because we do we milk our cows twice a day at 3 in the morning and then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So while we are doing our morning milking at 3, our, our other staff are cleaning the buns, our animal buns. Once the milking is finished, we take our animals to our buns, to, sorry, to our paddocks. I'm sure you can see behind me is one of the paddocks where we take our animals our animals will then be resting there while our staff are cleaning the rest of the the the, the, the milking area there's the milking parlor itself and then there's here where we are sitting the walkway and like i said the buns once they finish doing the cleaning the milking team also will be finishing with the with the cleaning up of the parlor they then go on to mixing the feed mm -hmm. they mix the feed <coughs> and this is supervised by our manager so once the feed is mixed, it's then put into the troughs where our animals feed from and our clean water is also put in the water troughs. And this is usually done by about 9, 10 o'clock, at which time our cows now come back to the barns. Mm -hmm. And then they are in the barns until about now 3 o'clock in the afternoon when we do our afternoon milking. Once we do our afternoon milking, the cleaning cycle then you know takes place again and the cleaning of the barns the filling up of the traps with the feed and the water and the feeds that we mix in the morning is enough for the day thank you so much my Marco, and that was very detailed you took us from a to z in a snippet showcasing that you really do know your stuff there you had it viewers this was my Marconi. she was taking us through the nitty gritties of her activities throughout the day she even goes on to tell us what each and every employee will be doing you need to understand that as you're working with your employees you need to delegate and understand their duties on that note we are going to go on a short commercial break we'll be right back with this and more in the second segment stay tuned Thank you so much for your staying tuned to Agricultural New Directions Agribusiness. Today we are here in Norton Machina Land West at Kentaya Smart Dairy, where we are looking at dairy production here in Zimbabwe. Now, viewers, we encourage you to be a part of these conversations. Feel free to get in touch with the producer, Wazanae Manure. It's on 0772807506. Alternatively, you can like our Facebook page, Agribusiness with Wazanae. Make a follow up on this episode and more, and leave your comments and suggestions. They are most welcome to us on our YouTube channel agribusiness with us and I. We are also now available on Twitter where most of these discussions take place. It's at agribusiness110. Now earlier on before into the break, Amem Akon here was telling us of uh, generally what a day looks like as a dairy farmer. But at this point in time I've taken the liberty of inviting Mr. Makoni Vamakoni here. He's going to be talking to us in terms of animal health, nutrition to mention but a few. Vamakoni, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. You're most welcome. Yes, as we get into our discussion, Mr. Marconi, can we talk about animal health in general? You would find that in each and every livestock production, uh, given if, uh, even if you look at piggery, even if you look at beef cattle ranching, you might have pests and diseases that might be a nuisance. But can we talk about those pests and diseases that are specific to dairy cattle here in Zimbabwe? Specific to dairy cattle, the diseases can be classified into 
some diseases that would require biological control mm -hmm. or making your farm biosecure, some diseases that also relate to your management, for example, mastitis. For biosecurity, we are looking at diseases that can actually come from other farms, um, including foot and mouth disease, lumpy skin. And we are also looking at um, diseases that are metabolic related to how you feed your animals, you can also get metabolic diseases. In terms of uh, biosecurity, it's very key and important that you secure your farm for the people coming into the farm and also even those exiting the farm because you don't want to export whatever problems you have to other farms. We are talking, as I said, foot and mouth disease. We are talking about lumpy skin disease and um, those are key and these are preventable preventable by uh, your farm adhering to a very good vaccine schedule mm -hmm. because some of them are viruses so you need a good vaccine schedule as part of your management program then uh, you are looking at uh, dipping your animals people call it january disease and it usually happens during the rainy seasons you actually end up getting tick-borne diseases. You actually have to understand which kind of tick uh, medicine is effective so that at times you might have to rotate the medicines mm -hmm. to avoid uh, the resistance of the ticks where you can still end up with tick-borne diseases. Now, when we come to our management and our hygiene, we can actually introduce diseases like mastitis which is an other disease mm -hmm. and with mastitis you can end up with subclinical mastitis which you can't see and it's affecting your productivity it's affecting the animal and also it's not one kind of uh, bacteria that would attack with mastitis you can have mastitis that's fungal you can have mastitis that comes from bacteria you can have mastitis that is even viral. Mm -hmm. So those are things that we guard against by improving the cleanliness of where the animals are housed, um, the kind of the procedures that we use to milk our animals, where we can actually prevent that disease by using quality teat dips. Mm -hmm. And these teat dips, again, you need to understand that they are not all effective. Mm -hmm. There are some which are chlorine-based, which are much more effective, and you need to use them pre- and post-dipping. And if we are using water, we also have to use potable water, water that is clean and does not bring us issues to our others. And by just dipping your kettle, with a teat dip that's very strong. When we say strong, we are talking of a kill factor, which we say log kill six, mm -hmm. meaning it can actually kill 99.9% .9 of the bacteria that's on the surface of the udder. And after we milk the animals, we dip again so that we protect that thin film of milk that goes on the udder. And also the teat canal is remaining open for up to two, three hours after milking, mm -hmm. that will actually protect the teat from any infection. Then we come to metabolic diseases. Metabolic diseases are now related to what we are feeding our animals. A dairy animal or a cattle are what we call ruminants. Yes. Ruminants evolved on eating grass, hay, or what we call forage. With that, we also want to maximize use of forage because if we put it up to almost 60%, it has an impact on our cost of production. But as a, the animal digests, it requires a lot of that forage, minimum 40%. And what you can add to top up the energy and the protein is coming from our concentrates which are what we call dairy meal 
or maybe we add some uh, soy meal, cotton cakes, or things with high protein so that we boost our protein content. Sometimes uh, when we reduce the amount of fiber in the digestion, you can have one of the problems is uh, displaced double mushroom where the animal does not digest well, has a lot of gas with the system, the digestive system becomes like a balloon, it goes up, it gets yeah. displaced, the animal cannot digest. Okay. There are other also issues that come from not understanding what you are feeding in terms of the um, calcium or minerals that are in the feed, which you can actually understand what's in your feed by taking routinely taking your feeds to a laboratory that tells you of the quality of your hay, quality of your dairy meal or whatever you are feeding. Because with calcium, you can also have a metabolic disease which happens as soon as the animals give birth. You can have a disease called hypocalcemia, okay. low calcium in the blood. That then you can lose the animal, productivity goes down. The other disease you can have is called ketosis, mm -hmm. which happens when the animal is now reverting to using its body reserves to digest itself and bring a lot of fatty acids into its system. And that also has an effect in getting your animal breed back so it will extend the time that you are going to re-inseminate or re uh, get the animal pregnant again. Our aim is to get a calf born every year. So if we exceed 90 days after the animal has given birth because the metabolic problems are affecting us, it means our calving interval is going to increase and reduce our profitability. Thank you so much, Wamakoni. From this discussion, I can tell that you really do know your stuff. Mudori Denereru Zivo, you managed to mention a lot of diseases and how you are taking care of your kettle in a short space of time. Thank you so much for that. On that note, viewers, we've come to the end of the second segment. We're going to go on a short commercial break. We'll be right back with this and more in the third and final segment. Stay tuned. Welcome back viewers, you are watching Agriculture on New Directions, Agribusiness in support of Vision 2030 and today we are looking at dairy production here in Zimbabwe. Earlier on before into the break, Mr. Makoni here was just telling us generally on the pests and diseases that can be a menace in dairy production. Mr. Makoni, we are here in the third and final segment, mm -hmm. welcome back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As we get into this final segment, our discussion, I want us to talk about issues surrounding your feeding regimen. I understand that you are producing your own pastures here. Yeah? Can we talk about uh, consumption, feed consumption? Generally, per cow, what are we looking at? And generally, also issues surrounding your feeding. If you overfeed a dairy cow, what happens? If you underfeed it as well, what happens? The economies and diseconomies of scale, the production economics in dairy production, aligning it to the feeding regimen. That's a key question. And um, all about dairy is your profitability that is governed by your cost of feed and the price of milk. So we normally call it income over feed cost. So for a dairy farmer, it's very key to understand that you start from your feed budget for your cattle. You group your animals into different groups to understand for the dairy cow, we are aiming at 3.2% of the body weight of the animal as what we will then use as the kind of dry feed with no moisture at all that we will have to store to feed our animals. At 3.2% of body weight, we are also looking at 60, 50 to 60 percent of that coming from the forage and uh, 40 percent maybe to 50 percent maximum coming from the concentrates and we are also saying from the forage it should have enough energy and protein those are th two key things energy protein and then the micro minerals and everything 
So if we take an animal that weighs about 600 kgs, for example, 3.2% of the body weight will tell us that we would need about 18 kgs of dry feed. And if we are feeding at 50%, concentrate 50% forage, we are now saying 9 kilos of dry feed, feed with no moisture. Okay. And to prepare for that, it makes us prepare how do we reduce our cost of production. As we mentioned earlier, we reduce cost of production by maximizing quality feeding, quality forages. Now, Mama Kony, I want us to talk about issues in our economy when we talk about reduction of the import bill. You would find that at times, as a country, we end up spending more in terms of food substances that we can produce ourselves. We do have the conducive environment to produce our own foodstuffs. But at times, our economy might suffer getting into the negative because we end up importing stuff such as cheese, milk and other dairy products. What would you recommend, your sentiments, your views, your opinion in terms of making, the, revitalizing the dairy industry for the sake of our community and our society in Zimbabwe? Revitalizing the dairy industry is key and it comes from uh, profitability of the farmers to give them the incentive to do so. Besides profitability, we need to be competitive. Yes. To be competitive, we need to understand that dairy is a low margin commodity. As a low margin commodity, for farmers to get the income that would encourage them to stay in the industry, they need to produce large volumes of quality milk. Consistent production of large volumes or quantities of quality milk is what keeps dairy farmers in the industry happy and producing. So we are saying competitiveness is looking at how many animals are going to make you break even? Mm -hmm. And for economic business units, we'll start from maybe 25, depending on the breed of animal that's being used, it may go to 50 animals minimum so that the farmer can start breaking even. So here, we are now saying the larger the heads, mostly will bring more competitiveness. And what then demands keeping large animals is you have the electricity that will make you irrigate your pastures, be food secure, which is driving 60 to 70 percent of your production is feed. Yes. So if you don't have power to irrigate, if you don't have power to uh, produce or make your own farm feed rations, then you might have to resort to other issues like uh, fossil fuels. If you don't have uh, even biogas, or solar or some things that could help you or bring in extra investment in that, then it will not. So in terms of policy, we need to look at what are the key things that will affect a dairy farmer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The key driver, 60 to 70 percent is feed. How would we make a farmer food secure? The budgets, making sure there is enough water to irrigate, making sure that uh, the cost of the inputs that are coming as feed are much lower and at the same time making sure that whatever the cakes that are produced with other industries, associative industries, are kept within the country and not exported. Thank you so much, Wamako, and for that. You spoke of competitiveness as being one of those key drivers that can revitalize our industry, our dairy industry. It was a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you, you're most welcome. From me, your host was Zanai Manyore. I'm also on Instagram. It's a W Manyore. And the crew behind the scenes. Have yourselves a fabulous evening. Thank you for watching.